I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Jack Sarfati, a theoretical physicist specializing in advanced propulsion research. Dr. Sarfati has a PhD in physics from the University of California, taught physics at San Diego State University, worked with David Bohm at the University of London's Burbeck College, and with Abdu Salam at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Jack was the basis of the memorable time-traveling Dr. Emmett Brown in the Back to the Future trilogy and the author of Super Cosmos, Destiny Matrix, Space Time and Beyond 2, and the co-author with Fred Allen Wolf and Bob Tobin of Space Time and Beyond for an explanation of the unexplainable. In this presentation, Dr. Sarfati proposes a new approach to warp drive design, utilizing gravitational metamaterials to create a low-power warp drive based on the conventional and well-accepted principles of relativity theory. He will also describe how this new model for warp drive propulsion explains the reported flight performance of UAPs as described in the U.S. Navy Nimitz encounters. Okay, this is the, this is the problem. This is the problem, uh, and I'm referring to uh, point, point number one, the sudden and instantaneous acceleration that is reported uh, by the Navy and other sources, the, uh, the apparent hypersonic velocities without signatures, that is, there's no disturbance of the atmosphere, like you'd see a jet engine, a jet exhaust, sonic boom, stuff like that. Low observability, a kind of stealthy thing. Now, the, this four transmedium travel, I um, I don't have much to say about that. The, uh, that's Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff, who uh, seems to have it does have or did have access to classified data, along with Eric Davis. You know, they they're more plugged into the intelligence establishment. They claim that, and I can sort of see that. Yeah, maybe possible with metric engineering, but I'm not gonna, I don't really know too much about four, but the positive lift, yes, definitely a positive lift. That's the anti-gravity feature. I can explain that and make predictions with that. So let's say points number one, two, three, and five is what I'm talking about. Number four, I'll leave that for Hal Putoff to explain more what, what, what he means by that. And uh, I know there've been the uh, um, claims about that, so let's go on to the, oh, and one other thing before we, we change slides. I must say, I'm probably the, I probably have the longest institutional memory of anybody alive today in 2021 about UFOs. Why is that? Because already when I was about 10 years old, about 10 years old, I, I, I met an army, an army officer. Well, my grandfather was working for the army down at the Quartermaster Corps in the New York City Garment District. And uh, I was living with my grandparents at the time. And after school and on school holidays, I would go to work with my grandfather and I uh, down at the Army Quartermaster Corps where they had all these like laboratories. <laughs> and uh, uh, this happened over the course of a year or two. I was, maybe I was like 10 or 11. So this would have been like 1949, 1950. And I used to hang out with these army officers and I was you know, reading science fiction books, astounding analog, all those science fiction things and into rockets and all that stuff. And, um, and one officer in particular, I think was Phil Corso, Phil Corso who wrote <laughs> the, the day after Roswell, because I can't be certain, but when I saw uh, Corso's um, photograph when Bill Burns' book came out several years ago, it like rang a bell as an instant recognition. So I, and in any case, what I'm saying is I was part of a project already starting as a child around 10 years of age and on. Then later in high school, I was part of a group of super kids um, uh, that was uh, being funded by, um, what's his name? Uh, this guy, one, one of the, uh, uh, one of the founders of Texas Instruments was, was out of Columbia University. And um, it involved, uh, uh, they were trying to, well, it would involved uh, people from the government, from Sandia Corporation. You know, we, after school, we had all these intense uh, seminars uh, in Manhattan. It was led by this guy, Walter Breen, who was kind of a controversial character. Uh, and, um, it was because it was several years that we were tested for psychic abilities. You know, it was like this, it was like that movie. 
and uh, we were you know, given advanced information on physics, stuff like that. And periodically, these guys would come from, uh, I think it was Sandia Corporation, or some, in any case, Albuquerque. They looked like FBI agents, you know, with the black suits. They would lecture us on patriotism. Remember, this is 1950s, early 1950s. This is the McCarthy era. And, uh, and there was a lot of stuff on anti-communism. I know Ayn, people from Ayn Rand was involved in this. And one of the kids in the project actually was, was Milton Friedman, who, you know, from the, uh, from the Federal Reserve. He was older than me. And another kid was uh, Johnny Glogower, who was a quiz kid, won a Westinghouse scholarship. And in um, any case, uh, it was because of this uh, uh, program, after school program, that um, I uh, received full scholarship to MIT, University of Chicago, and Cornell. And I chose to go to Cornell. And, uh, and so, so the point is, yeah, we were talking about flying saucers and the paranormal back then. So I'd say, so it's like 70 years, 70 years in which I've been involved in these fringe issues. And, you know, this is a, this is a little bit what uh, 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 Jacques Vallée and Eric Davis call high strangeness. There are all these synchronicities. All right, let's go on. We can come back to this uh, paranormal or high strangeness aspect of my world life, my life because it's very relevant to what's going on. So let's, let's go to the next slide. All right, this is a, uh, you know, at this point, all right, let me, let's just go through the slides, then we can open up to, to questions. I know Nick is here, he can ask intelligent questions. I don't know the other people. So uh, this is just a, a brief review of uh, general relativity. And uh, I won't say, let's go on to the next slide because you'll be able to see this on your own and hopefully some of you have already seen this slideshow. Let's go on to the next slide. This is more about what, uh, how general relativity works. And let's go on to the next slide. Again, about the, gra the real gravity fields are described by the, the curvature tensor of space time. Oh, okay, now here we have, uh, Einstein's field equation, that's important. Einstein's field equation um, in the uh, uh, GAB is RAB minus one F GAB R. Okay, what's important is that term, eight pi times Newton's constant capital G divided by C to the fourth, where C is normally considered to be the speed of light in vacuum, okay? And now these, these equations are what are called tensor equations. If there be a, t oh, well, I, I'm gonna come back to this technical point because I'm gonna need my, my iPad to be able to draw what I'm talking about. So what I'm pointing at this point is just look at that coefficient on the right-hand side of the equation, eight pi g over c to the four. That's the key object, mathematical object that I'll be talking about that I claim along with uh, 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 Professor Keith Wanzer, who's uh, on the faculty at Cal physics department, Cal State Fullerton, I claim we can control that factor by making it big. We can produce a strong gravitational field on the left-hand side using a small amount of energy, which is that TAB or energy density, stress energy density actually. Uh, and, that's, and that's how the Tic Tacs work. That's how all the UFOs work. They're low power warp drive vehicles. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, well, let's just, uh, this is uh, uh, some, numer some uh, numer numerical work showing why anti-gravity is so hard. Anti-gravity is so hard because it's very difficult to bend space-time. In fact, if you read the standard books about it, even like uh, Jim Woodward's book, uh, Making Starships or something like that, uh, he says it takes like a Jupiter amount. You'd have to, you'd have to take the entire mass of the planet Jupiter and convert it into energy in order to get anything useful. And of course that's impossible. And that's not what, what the Navy is seeing in these Tic Tacs. The Navy is seeing these things buzzing them in, in uh, restricted uh, battle spaces and uh, they're, they're hardly using any energy. So there's something that they're missing. There's something that the pundits are, are missing. Let's go on to the next, to the next slide. Okay, well, this is from, I just wanna give a little credit to this guy, David Chester, 
who prepared these slides actually, and he's a PhD uh, in physics, theoretical physics, physics, University of California, was an undergraduate at MIT. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, again, okay, this is more on, on the alternate views of the matter gravity coupling. And I encourage anybody who's seriously interested in the subject on their own time to go through this slideshow. Uh, the slideshow is available. It'll be, you can look at it at your leisure. And also you feel free to send me email messages if you have questions later on by email. You know, this is, this is difficult, complicated stuff. And um, we're doing the best we can. Okay, the space-time stiffness of vacuum. Using the speed of light and vacuum, you see it's, it's, it's 10, to the, 10 to 43 Newtons. That's a lot. That's too big. That's how stiff space time is you know, using uh, units of force, using the MKS system units of force. Okay, let's let's go on to the next slide. All right, let's skip. Okay, well, no, this is important. Okay. The key thing about general relativity is what are called geodesics. Uh, what's the simplest geodesic in, in, in Euclidean geometry and in Newtonian non-relativistic physics, the geodesic of, of space-time is simply a particle moving in a straight line in flat space-time at constant speed without any acceleration. That's, that's, that's the geodesic for, uh, for flat space-time. Uh, and uh, it, it accords with our uh, uh, common sense notions. Now this gets generalized. This gets generalized in the curved space-time of general relativity which is the, and uh, what happens, the geodesics, the geodesics are paths of what are called test particles. What is a test, a test particle is a, is a mass where we can ignore that it's generating its own gravitational field. In other words, the mass is so small compared to, let's say the mass of the earth, that it's only the mass of the earth that whose gravitational field we, we have to consider. And what happens is, any test particle that's neutral, there's no electromagnetic fields, there's no net electromagnetic charge or, or, or multipole moments, anything like that. So what'll happen is that the test particle will move on what's called a time-like geodesic. And I'll get back to all this when I have my Apple iPad with my Apple pencil, I can draw all this, pardon the noise, that's a truck. Um, and, um, and so the point is this, what about these geodesics? Well, when you're on a geodesic, you're weightless. Okay, a good example of a geodesic is the International Space Station orbiting the Earth in free, free motion orbiting the Earth, and say circular elliptical orbits. And uh, all the astronauts are uh, weightless in there. They're floating around or they have, to, they, have to, they have to tie themselves down or use magnetic boots. Uh, it's not like, um, uh, space Odyssey, where we have a rotating thing to make artificial gravity, but uh, so the point is this: that if you're if you're moving, if you're free floating, John Archibald Wheel likes to call it free floating on a geodesic, rather than free falling. But if when you're when you're just drifting along on a geodesic, uh, you're weightless. There's no g force on you. Okay, but but if you look at that space station. And it, it, it has some triple acceleration relative to us. So it appears to be accelerating, but it, in fact, it's not really accelerating to the guys on board. So there are two ideas of acceleration that most people do not understand very well, including a lot of engineers who should know better and even some physicists who should know better. In, in general relativity, there, we have what is called proper acceleration. That is the local g-force that, that that a person feels. And in order to have G-force, you have to have a, a non-gravitational force. It generally, it'll just be the electromagnetic force has to act on some charges in the material and it has to push the system off the, the natural time-like geodesic. Now this is happening to us on earth all the time. That's why we feel weight. The reason we feel weight, that we feel heavy is because we are, properly accelerating radially outward all the time. We're being pushed by the electromagnetic forces of the earth of the you know, that, that we're sitting on. We're being, we're, we're accelerating outward 
but, but we're accelerating outward without moving, obviously. We're stationary because space-time is curved. See, this is a, uh, you see, if, if, if space-time is flat and you accelerate, you've got to move from one place to another. But when the space-time is curved due to gravitational field, you have to accelerate in order not to move at all. So this is a big thing that most people don't understand. Okay, and this confuses everybody. It confuses a lot of, especially it confuses the military. It confuses Louis Elizondo. It confuses Christopher Mellon. It confuses Senator Marco Rubio. It confuses, uh, maybe it may even confuse Bob Bigelow. I don't know. <laughs> but it confuses a lot of people and it's understandable. But now, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, okay, well, uh, this is, uh, we'll come back to this later. Understanding Einstein's gravity field equation in general relativity, in a way, is no more difficult, if you look in the right way, no more difficult than understanding Ohm's law for simple uh, electrical circuits. You know, you, a voltage, you, put a, you apply a voltage to, to wires, you get a current to flow, and there's a resistor, and there's maybe a capacitor and an inductor and you get an os you know, all that stuff. So it's electrical circuit theory. You can understand by analogy, you can understand by analogy what Einstein's field equation is. It's uh, in terms of electrical circuit theory. There's an analogy there. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, the Alcupuri warp drive. All right. Now you've seen this a lot. And this is a toy model. It's not realistic, really. There are things, you know, wrong with it, but it just illustrates the uh, the idea. Now, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, this is a, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, see the reddish, the pink little lip underneath that that plane there. Okay, that's called a gravity redshift because space, uh, when you have attractive gravity field, the three dimensional space actually kind of contracts, and it causes the red, it causes a redshift. It's like spectral lines uh, from, uh, from, from uh, radiations from atoms, they'll be shifted toward the red, okay? Now in the back, so, so the nose, the, 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 imagine this to be like a, a flying saucer of some kind. So the red part is the, is the nose of the craft, say it's coming toward you. If you, see, if, you see the, if you see a flying saucer that's coming toward you, there's going to be a gravity redshift. It's pretty. It's going to be a gravity redshift, which is going to be opposing the the motional Doppler blue shift. Normally, you you know, if an object is moving fast toward you, uh, any kind of waves coming from that object tend to get shifted to higher frequency. That's called blue shift. But because of this gravitational effect, in addition to the motional effect. There's gonna, it's gonna weaken the blue shift. So, so in warp drive, in warp drive, the the gravitational redshift in front of the object at the nose of the object is gonna weaken or counteract the uh, the motional blue shift. And likewise, in the rear, in in the tail of the craft, where you normally would see a redshift because moving away from you, you're gonna see a blue shift. So anti gravity, and that's where space is is expanding. See, and um, and what's happening, the ship is just like surfing along, just freely floating on, on a geodesic. It's, this is geodesic motion, zero G-force inside. The ship is controlling its own local time-like geodesic. And there's no, it's not feeling any G-force. I mean, you can, if, if you design it better, you could have some G-force in there. But I'm talking about the optimal, the ideal, you know, the ideal situation. So, uh, so, and, but, but it's controlling, it's controlling its own geodesic, it's canceling out, say, the external gravitational field, it's overpowering the external gravitational field, and it's controlling and it can change its motion. So when you see the UFO or the Tic Tac, it, it appears to be going at 20,000 miles an hour and it then suddenly makes a big uh, right angle turn. And, and they say people like Kevin Knuth, who knows his special relativity, but it doesn't seem to understand uh, uh, general relativity that well, he uh, says, well, you have impossible G-forces. Yeah, they are impossible G-forces if the thing is moving through space. If it's not warp drive, if it's not warp drive, what you're seeing is impossible. But with warp drive, you're seeing exactly what you expect to see. So you, if you properly understand warp drive, there's no mystery on these motions, the high-speed motions with, with sudden changes or the apparent, apparent 
the parent, uh, the thing kind of disappears and it reappears somewhere else almost instantly. That's all easy to understand. It's exactly what you have in warp drive if you can control the gravitational field with small amounts of energy, which these things are obviously doing. That's an empirical fact. See, Nick, I hope you're listening to this. Say, we, I'm trying to explain facts. I'm not doing this out of, uh, like I'm jerking off because of some you know, string theory, 11 dimensional, you know, mathematical, I've smoked too much dope on mathematics. I mean, you know, they're saying, you know, uh, what did, uh, what, what was it Karl Marx or was it Lenin? Somebody said the opium, uh, 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 a religion is the, is the opiate of the masses. Well, in this case, uh, too much pure mathematics is the opiate of the theoretical physicist. And there's too much around. I'm going, and let me say this again, let me give a little history. About 50 years ago, and this is about the same time I met Nick Herbert, actually, uh, about 50 years ago, all kinds of weird things happened. And it was basically, it was the CI, Central Intelligence Agency, and um, uh, contractors and agents from the Central Intelligence Agency and the uh, Defense Department, in particular, a guy named George Koopman, who Nick knows very well. Uh, uh, I, I, this is like 19, when was this? Let's see, this was 1970, I guess 19, the, the end of 1975, right before the Esalen seminars that, uh, you know, that I had, Gary Zukov came down, he wrote the Dancing Wooly Masters. Uh, right before those seminars began, uh, Saul Paul Sirag and I and Fred Allen Wolf we were living in a uh, apartment right across the street from the Grace Cathedral. The apartment was paid for by a woman named Jean Lanier, who was a close friend of Lawrence Rockefeller. It was actually Rockefeller money, uh, paying for this uh, several flats. In fact, Brian Joseph, the Nobel Prize physicist, Brian Joseph stayed with us. He had just gotten married, I think, to his wife, Carol. And he spent about a week with us going down to see uh, Hal Putoff and, and um, uh, Russell Targ and... Uh, 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 Brendan O'Regan and Edgar Mitchell, all these guys, you know, testing uh, um, Uri Geller and people like that. In any case, um, so we're, I'm up there with, uh, I think Saul Paul Sirag was there and also Fred Allen Wolf, I think was there. And uh, we're, in, we're in the main room, uh, right? Uh, looking out the window, there's the, the Grace Cathedral right across the street from us on top of Knob Hill. And, uh, and uh, George takes out a bunch of, of, of uh, takes out a briefcase and he opens them and said, these are burglar tools. <laughs> and there's a CIA agent. <laughs> you have to learn how to break into, <laughs> how to open doors. And uh, yeah, George used to play, he used to try to train us. He said, well, look, if you're going to be a CIA agent, you have to have situational awareness. You go through all this stuff because we were very bad at it, you know, like trying to, what, 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 what color clothing is that woman wearing? And, you know, there's these training things, I guess, that they do uh, at uh, wherever their base is, Guantanamo, wherever the hell it is, uh, Quantico, I guess that's the FBI. Any case, he liked to play games. I was, uh, you know, intelligence agent games with us. And, you know, we were pretty young. We, but in any case, so we're up there this one time, and George gets very serious, and he says, there are two things the CIA wants you guys to figure out. Consciousness, this is the whole now, how the hippies save physics, David Kaiser's book talks about how does consciousness work? Why do they want about consciousness? What about consciousness? They want to control minds, right? I mean, this is, you know, MK Ultra. I could tell you a lot about MK Ultra too. And so how does consciousness work? And when, now when they say consciousness, I'm not talking Deepak Chopra, uh, you know, uh, enlightenment, Zen Buddhism. I'm not even, I'm not talking Nick Herbert's, uh, you know, he, he plays his flute, <laughs> you know, all that stuff goes into enlightenment. I mean, all that stuff is good. I have nothing against that stuff, you know, but that's not what George Cooper was talking. He wanted to know the physics of kind. He wanted to know what is there in ma matter that enables us to be conscious. That's, you know, the physics consciousness problem, the sort of thing that, that Hammeroff was trying to work on with, with Penrose, right? That they want to know, they want to know how to make machines that are conscious. And actually Nick Herbert did write a good book about this. Uh, I forget, um, yeah, he wrote a couple of books with this book about mind links, I forget what it's called, the mind, where, where Nick uh, envisages all these kinds of machines that the CIA really uh, 
and the intelligence agencies in general, and not just the CIA, it's the Russians, it's the Israelis, I can tell you a lot about that, uh, that they're all, they were all, what they want to know uh, how to control consciousness, you know, the obviously uh, for non-lethal weapons, we have Colonel John Alexander, right, with his non-lethal weapons, uh, where, I mean, why, why use a, a neutron bomb? Why, why use napalm? Why use any of these weapons that destroy property if we can just win a war by controlling the enemy's mind? Okay. Now, of course, we know the, I get a whole thing of side wars with, you know, with the CIA involved with that, and William Colby, the DCI, and what the Russians were doing, and Uri Geller and the Mossad. You know, that's a whole other aspect of what we're involved in here. Okay. And, um, or the high strangeness factor. So in any case, so that was CIA and Defense Department. We were actually getting money from that directly from the CIA. Uh, George's uh, group, INS group was a defense contractor and we were getting money from the Army Tank Command and from the United States Air Force. And also, um, uh, you know, from, from Rockefeller via Jean Lanier and her husband, Sidney Lanier. Uh, so in any case, they want to know how consciousness works. Then, what's the second thing? That's what's important now, today, right? With UFA. How do flying sources fly? How do flying sources fly? And those are the two things they want to know. And basically, that's what I've been working on for 50 years. And actually, even before 70 years, I go back because I think I met Phil Corso and all these army guys uh, at the Quartermaster Corps. Uh, you know, they were, they were talking flying sauce to me back then in 1949. That's two years after Roswell, maybe three years after Roswell. Okay. Now there's also talk that, that, the, uh, that one of the reasons the CIA was created in 1947 is because of, the, uh, because of Kenneth Arnold and you know, the flying sauce of flap. Uh, and I also happen to know from very direct, reliable source that one of the creators of the Central Intelligence Agency was a man named James Jesus Angleton. Now, Angleton was very, very concerned, very concerned about the flying saucer issue, took it very seriously. And James Angleton, uh, he collected a huge amount of uh, intelligence on flying saucer um, uh, events. I know this from a member of the family, okay? Remember the Angleton family. Uh, and I know a lot about that. So. But okay, so there we are. But the two the two problems are related: consciousness, flying saucers, or UAPs. Now we okay. Let's go on to the next slide. We come back. You can ask questions about all this later. Let's let's uh, go to the next slide. Ah, there we go. This is important. Now, this is very important. Uh, this is a picture, it's a space-time diagram, and what I'm showing are pictures of the local light cones, okay? Now, there's a thing, now the papers, I think I've discovered a serious mistake in almost every warp drive theoretical paper that's been published from Alcubierre onward. Even the guys, that they, they've gotten confused about something. They're claiming, and this is a, a correspondent, Eric Davis, if you're listening, pay some attention to this, they're claiming there's a problem. They're claiming if you have a warp drive, if it goes superluminal, there's going to be a problem because you're going to have, they're claiming there's going to be a problem of local event horizons. What's going to happen? I think there's going to be, I forget if it's a black hole horizon in the front of you or and a white hole in the rear of you. But in any case, there's going to be horizon problem so that if you're in warp drive and if it's faster than light warp drive, you cannot navigate the ship because you won't be able to see the outside. You won't be able to see the outside. Uh, because of what's called a horizon problem. And here's an example of a horizon. Uh, look, at, look at that, that, um, that dotted orange uh, line. It says an apparent horizon for Bob. Okay. This is, see, Bob is, Bob is, the Bob is the, uh, is the blue light cones. So what happens is, see, see the light, the light will never reach Bob. So what's happening in, from Bob's point of view, if he's trying to look at Alice, at a certain point, Alice is going to disappear from view, from view because no light signals from Alice can ever reach Bob because light signals from Alice well, or any signal from Alice would have to be outside of Alice's local light cone. And the idea is if you don't have fast and light signals, you're going to 
there's that's that's called a horizon but see internally there's no problem internally there's no problem for alice who's in the ship she could be going fast and light and she could see ahead of her there's no horizon for alice the horizon is only for bob so so people got very confused what they've done what they've done is to confuse what the distant observer is seeing with what the local observer actually sees so there's no horizon. I claim there's no horizon problem for local observers. There's only what appears to be horizon because they're using the wrong equations. They're using, they're using what, the equations for what Bob sees, who's far away from Alice. And now you could also say, well, what about the problem of uh, colliding with cosmic dust and objects and stuff? That's not going to be a problem either, unless that's not going to be a problem for, for, for uh, particles that are surrounding the ship that are also on geodesic motions because they're also going to be manipulated by the gravity by the local gravitational field that Alice is controlling within her ship. So I'm saying that the situation for fast and light warp drive, say relative to the Earth, say if we want to get to an exoplanet, fast and light, uh, that that's not it's not the situation is not as bad as everybody thinks. Which of course, if um, if if what I'm I could be wrong, but if what I'm saying is correct, that also means it's a lot easier for hostile aliens, ETs, using warp drive to get to us if they want to like destroy us, the you know, military threat. Now, there's one thing that um, Christopher Mellon, who uh, who's Christopher Mellon, he's one of the guys with Louis Elizondo and Hal put off, and uh, that that clown Tom DeLong that they left. He, you know, he's uh, he, uh, Christopher Mellon, he's a, he's a blue blood. Yeah, he's the grandson of Andrew Mellon, who was Secretary of the Treasury and one of the top, you know, most powerful people of his time. Well, not only wealthy, but also politically powerful. And Christopher Mellon, at one point during the, Obama, during the Clinton administration, and I think the early part of the um, of, uh, uh, but of, of W's administration was in the Defense Department, and for some time he was, he was a, a, a protege of William Cohen, who was Secretary of Defense. And at one point he was uh, 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 like an assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. Even he's now he's not a scientist. He went to Colby College uh, in history of political science, something. He has a, like an international uh, finance degree or something from Yale. Of course, every you know they all go to Yale, right? Skull and bones and all that, and. Um, so, and, but the, and, and, and uh, Christopher does say, and I agree with Christopher Miller on this point, Christopher does say that he thinks these UAPs are a military threat. And Louis Elizondo says that too. Louis Elizondo is kind of a, you know, he's an army, uh, 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 was an army ranger or something, uh, army intelligence, sort of like George Koopman. And uh, Elizondo thinks that, you know, they're a threat too. And of course, uh, we have these, um, this guy, Frank Milburn, who I know, who I work with. Frank is a retired, uh, is a retired British army. I think he was a commander of some kind, Red, Red Berets or something. Uh, and uh, he also works, uh, does, writes papers for the Mossad think tank, the, uh, the Begin Sadat uh, Institute at Bar Line University. He's written two, two papers, two white papers for them, in which my work is mentioned, Louis Elizondo's in it, Chris Mellon, Colonel John Alexander, all this stuff. So the, uh, uh, I know the, uh, and of course I know Uri Geller very well. Uri Geller is tied in with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And Geller himself was basically a Mossad agent. It's now public knowledge, it's in his, his books. And of course we know, I mean, the Israelis are pretty smart people and we know that they're very interested in the military threat posed by what the US Navy is reporting in the Nimitz Institute uh, uh, incidents and the uh, the others, there have been several others now. Uh, Isaac the Roosevelt and, uh, and well others. There's a whole bunch of stuff, and and also I know the Russians because I've been interviewed by the Russians. So Bell and Mia Putin's uh, agents came and videoed me about a lot of this stuff during the Obama administration. This was this was uh, years before. It was I guess around 2014. So I, and I happen to know that the Russian military intelligence and there's Russians in touch with me, that they've been, so this is international. They're all interested in it. And apparently also the Russian Navy has had encounters with these warp drive, low energy warp drive vehicles. 
uh, the same as the US Navy and uh, apparently the Chinese may have. They, so this is happening all over the place. So one thing I wanna be very clear about, this is not a theoretical issue I'm talking about. We actually have facts. It's like, okay, when Einstein was testing his general theory of relativity, he predicted the bending of light by the sun, okay? For me, what I'm saying with low power, all these reports by the, by the Navy now made official by the Pentagon since October, 2017, these are like the gravitational bending of light. These are facts. I'm taking these to be facts. I'm explaining these facts. Well, let's put it this way. Maybe it's a big massive disinformation. You know, like, <laughs> in fact, I, I, I think it's funny because uh, uh, Chris Mellon's uh, cousin is John Warner IV, who's the son of the late Senator Warner, who was sec Secretary of the Navy. Uh, and they're like third cousins. They even went to summer camp together and they're on opposite sides of this thing. <laughs> Okay, I think John, John seems to think that this whole thing is some kind of cover up. Maybe uh, John Warner, uh, you can correct me if I misunderstand your position. But in any case, I know you, you, you and your cousin, uh, there's a family feud about this issue. So let's put it this way. Suppose this was a massive disinformation thing by the Pentagon and by the, by the global, by the uh, defense, by the military industrial complex. They want to get more money. So suppose they're going to fake an extraterrestrial invasion. Okay, so I was going to fake it. All right, but even so, my physics still works. Even, even if this thing is fake, the physics I'm talking about is going to work. And the technology that, was, that we're seeing in these um, observations is explained by what I'm talking about. So whether, whether, the, uh, whether those Tic Tac, this is for Mike Turbina, whether those Tic Tac videos are real or fake, I don't care whether they're fake or not, because maybe the joke's on them. Suppose they are fake, Mike, Mr. Turbo, who's Air Force Intelligence or retired Air Force Intelligence. Suppose they're fake. Well, guess what? The joke's going to be on you because we could build these things anyway. But suppose they're real. If they're real, then it's even worse because then we really have to worry about who's in control of any of these things because with these kinds of weapons, these are weapons, don't, they're definitely weapons. With this kind of technology, we don't have a chance. It's like Independence Day. You know, it's like War of the Worlds, unless there's some virus wipes them out. Okay, so I want to summarize here saying that, yeah, this is a military threat, guys. And that's why I'm calling this the, intel the second intelligence failure of 2021. Back to 20 years ago, intelligence failure. They didn't get, Clinton could have gotten Osama bin Laden. There was all kinds of screw-ups there. The FBI wasn't talking to the CIA. We have similar stupidity happening today. Uh, the, uh, the right people are, are not talking to me about what this technology really means, what the military threat really means. The Russians take me very seriously. The Russians know what I'm talking about, but the Americans, we have, you know, there's political issues going on here. There's stonewalling. Uh, I'm, the, 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 the people in the Pentagon should be talking to me. Randolph Stone, I'm talking to you. You're in the inspector general's office. You're not doing your job. You should give me a phone call and we should discuss this thing because it's your job to figure out what's going on. And maybe I misunderstand your job. Oh, these, these guys, apparently the guys who wrote the UAP Pentagon report, a bunch of young guys, young schmucks, they don't know anything. Maybe they're 20 years old, they're young lieutenants or something. They don't, they're not physicists. They don't know what's going on. That's why the report was so, was so stupid. It was a nothing burger. All right. Okay. Let's. All right. Enough of that. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Now the big thing here is you hear Hal put off. So he he mentioned he pays lip service to meta materials, and so does Louis Elizondo. You keep hearing that they, they it's a buzzword. Meta materials is a buzzword. Do they ever explain how meta materials fit into the? to the phenomenon? Do they explain why, why metamaterials? They don't say anything. They just they say, oh, metamaterials, we found a, the, this debris, we think it's a metamaterial, but it's slag, it's been melted, it's heated. Uh, Linda Melton uh, was a, somehow somebody gave it to, was it George Knapp or to Linda Moulton Howe, and it's been around for 20 years. And, and the one interesting thing that Eric Davis does say somewhere, as I recall, is that the, the scale of the metamaterials goes down to like an angstrom, 10 to minus eight. 
centimeters. Lattices with a lattice spacing like 10 to the minus eight centimeters. That's like a 10th of a nanometer. And that's beyond any technology. Now this was stuff that, that was found 20, 30 years ago, right? So we didn't have the technology to build that then. So, so is it extraterrestrial? Well, it may be coming from our future. See, it could be time travel. I think it's time travel, I have reason, but, but let's, so, so the point is that although Tucker Carlson has Nick Pope, who doesn't know anything either, he's a nice guy, you know, he's a, he was not, he's not a scientist. The, the Ministry of Defense had him, you know, investigating UFOs and it's good, it's all good that they did that, but, you know, they, none of them have a clue about what, how the physics works. And they, they, they just uh, say, uh, Louis Elizondo says, oh, the physics is, you know, we don't understand it. Louis Elizondo doesn't understand it. Even Hal Putoff may not understand it. I tried to explain some of it. I was actually with Hal Putoff and Kit Green in October, late October, like October 26, 27, 28, in London. And I was with them at this meeting with David Bohm, uh, uh, Centennial, and... <laughs> <laughs> we were in the hotel room. I remember, every calls were coming in from Washington D.C. from the Pentagon. Maybe of Leslie Keen, people like that. And either Kit Green or Hal would have to go out of the room and talk, you know, because they didn't want me to hear what was going on. They were setting up the 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 uh, the October the uh, December uh, release from the New York Times. Of you know, it was pretty funny. I was actually there in the room when all this was going on. So that's a synchronicity. Why did that happen? Well, I can tell you all kinds of weird synchronicities like that, and uh, which it, and I can tell you why I think it is happening. But let's go on to so the metamaterials. I'm the only guy. Me with Keith Wanza. I'm the only guy who has an explanation based on conventional physics that explains why metamaterials are important for warp drive. And one of the things when I say based on conventional physics, uh, Nick, I'm talking Nick, I'm talking to you. Yeah, of course, I've gone a little bit beyond conventional physics, but only what, what John Archibald Wheeler calls radical conservative extension of known physics. Very minimal change in what is battle test and what we know, as opposed to going into like M theory of Ed Witten. You know, it's all mathematics. I don't see any physics there, except maybe they, 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 they what seems to have some physics is. Uh, uh, Lenny Susskind's hologram picture is being now applied in condensed matter physics, quantum Hall effect, these edge states, bulk states. That looks like, that's like the hologram, the hologram theory of uh, uh, of Susskind does seem to have some practical application. It's interesting because he's there with the guy Lachlan, who also did uh, quantized Hall effect. So there, there, there is, you know, and graphene, all that kind of stuff. So there is some, there is some, uh, application of the holograph ideas, but there's a lot of stuff that's going on in string theory that, you know, that's just uh, nonsense. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, beautiful mathematics, impressive mathematics, as I say, mathematics, the opiate of the uh, theoretical physicists. Let's go on to the next thing. Next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so here is more. All right. Well, I'll get back to this. Let me have a little water. The low, the equation here, the cosine Einstein's equation, but has this cosine thing. The cosine comes be because the source of the, of the induced gravity warp field is going to be an electromagnetic pump field, electromagnetic field in dielectrics, and in fact, metamaterial dielectrics. Uh, it, the the uh, the um, the permittivity. The permeability, there are other, the magneto, there's all kinds of stuff in the susceptibility, different kinds of susceptibility when the metamaterial is anisotropic and inhomogeneous and dynamic, what's called space-time metamaterials. You have the, the constitutive parameters of the metamaterial have imaginary parts. They're complex fields. And, and they're imaginary parts, and that's because of dissipation. That's heat, like joule, like the resistance the resistance in a uh, LCR circuit, uh, when you actually do the mathematics, it appears like an imaginary part in, in, the, in the basic equations of motion when you do a Fourier um, transform. Any case, so we have this imaginary part and that leads to this cosine function, but this is the key, this is beautiful, that nobody's noticed it before. I haven't seen this in any textbook at all because you know why? Let me, let me explain something. When you read any book on general relativity almost, and especially the, the, the papers, the, 
the, the, the theoretical physicists who do general relativity, except for people like Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne's like an engineer, and yeah, because he Wheeler was an engineer. Except for those guys, they they they, they want to do they want to be like pure mathematicians. They want to be elegant. So what do they do? I said capital G equal one. I said C equal one. And it's not even there. It goes away. It goes away. I have GAB. It's TAB. So of course they never think of what the hell, they, they never really think of what's going on inside a material. They don't know solid state physics. I'm not a good solid state physicist either, I must admit, but Keith Wands is a very good solid state physicist. He knows what's going on inside, okay? But I know it's important to know what's going on inside materials. And, um, and then there's this bogus, I mean, they say, oh, well, it's gotta be the speed of light and vacuum in the coupling because that's an invariant. Well, it turns out there's, we can make an invariant for the what 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 under certain specialized conditions becomes like the speed of light inside material, it's invariant in terms of Einstein's gravity field equations. Everything's invariant. Everything is mathematically kosher. Okay, so no, but look, this cosine thing, it's a phase shift. It's a phase shift. What happens is you have say electromagnetic fields coming in, and they induce a gravity field, and there's a relative time delay, a phase shift between the input electromagnetic field and the output gravitational field that it's generating. And if that phase shift is, is right, there's a sign change and that's anti-gravity. We got anti-gravity guys. It's there, it's in materials. You don't see it, you don't see it. Normally in most materials, you won't see it because most materials, you know, the, the dissipation is, uh, is not that important. And um, any case, what I'm saying is prediction now, it's extremely easy to make anti-gravity with hardly any energy at all. It's just, a fa it's just you just got to tweak, you just got to uh, tune how much dissipation there is relative to how much non-dissipation there is. Or in terms of microscopic physics, how much inelastic photon, electron, positive, uh, how much photon scattering off charges, whether you know, negative or positive charge in the material, uh, uh, how much inelastic scattering, which is generating heat, versus elastic forward scattering, which is kind of reactive, which is, you know, which is reversible. If you change that ratio, and if you change enough, the, the gravity field you induce is going to go from attractive to repulsive. And of course, that's great, because that's what you need for warp drive. That's what we see these Tic Tacs actually doing. Now, if you have anti-gravity, you have what's called the blue shift anti because what's happened with, with anti-gravity when it actually expands space it's actually causing it's it's opposite to what, what you normally think in terms of motional doppler effect so you can have a blue shift now let me get back there's this guy named you all heard of bob bigelow right bob bigelow and jacques Vallée and kit green and John Alexander and John, uh, George Knapp, the, the, the Las Vegas gang, and they're all tied in with Senator Harry Reid, right? Senator Harry Reid, Speaker of the House at one point. And at one point, uh, uh, Bob Bigelow, who is a Mormon, by the way, he, no, he's Mormon, that's important, because the Mormons are, uh, the Mormon religion is a, is a flying saucer cult, basically, ETs and all that stuff. And, you know, and Bigelow um, uh, was re really into flying saucers. And also he had this thing called the Skinwalker Ranch up in Utah where all these, uh, if you read, there, there's a paper, in fact, The High Strangest People by Jacques Vallée and Eric Davis, they talk about a, what appears to be a wormhole, a little Stargate a floating orb wormhole, which a Bigfoot, I, this sounds pretty crazy, but you know, a Bigfoot gorilla type creature comes out of the damn thing, comes out of the, 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 the I got, a, I came out of that wormhole right behind me, but this big, uh, the, but my cousin Bigfoot, he, he came out of a real one that was hovering above the Skinwalker Ranch allegedly. So this is a story that goes back to like 20 years or something like that, or 15, 20 years. Okay, so what happens is that Bob Bigelow sells his ranch to another Mormon, another very rich Mormon. Okay, Mormons are rich, they're smart. And it's a guy named Brandon Fugel. Brandon Fugel. And he has on History Channel now, he has the Skinwalker Ranch series. And they're talking also, they claim a thousand feet above them, this is like this sphere, it looks like there's this thing. They think it's a, they, he has a, Brandon Fugel has this guy, Travis Taylor, 
who's kind of a right out of central casting. You know, he's like a movie star, handsome kind of looks, and he's a physicist, astrophysicist. And uh, he's his, uh, Travis is his, uh, his science guy, right? <laughs> and they claim that, but here's the thing now. They're getting radiation sickness, man. They're claiming that, you know, a couple of guys that gotten sick, they think there's ionizing radiation. Well, what happens is if you stand, if you stand beneath a floating flying saucer that's in warp drive, you're going to get sick. You're going to get radiation sickness. Why is that? Because you have the gravity blue, the anti-gravity blue shift is ionizing, you know, the molecules and the atoms that are in the air or anything around. It's, 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 it's increasing its energy. It's a blue shift. It means that yeah, the energy is increasing. And yeah, you're going to get plasma. Yeah, there's just plasma. You're going to see all that stuff that they see. So that the fact that they were getting sick standing underneath this thing is totally explained as a hovering orb. Uh, okay, that, by the way, a, a Tic Tac can be a stargate too. The, the two things that it turns out that the, the uh, wormhole, like traveling through a wormhole, you know, stargates getting to, we get to Mars in a split second by just going through the gate, through the stargate. Uh, that's all. It's the same equation, just this equation, it's Einstein's equation with different boundary conditions, you know, different, the, the different applications of the same equation. So you can have your Tic Tacs, your flying saucers, they can operate as warp drive vehicles, even going, you know, they can go hundred miles an hour. It doesn't matter how fast they go. Uh, they can do everything the Navy reports seeing them do. And then they can also switch into Stargate mode. We can write mathematical solutions, you know, in fact, uh, What's his name? Uh, Matt Visser. Matt Visser is a very good relativist in, I think he's still in Australia or New Zealand. He's published a bunch of papers on this. Bunch of papers on this, you know, on, uh, on, on traversable wormhole solutions and, and how it connects with the warp drive solution. So, so that, that's all standard general relativity. And you just have to put <clears throat> the, the strong coupling that Keith Wanza and I have used the metamaterial trick to amplify the coupling between the applied stress energy source tensor, electromagnetic field source tensor, and the gravity field it, uh, it induces. And uh, yeah, we understand it. I mean, we, when I say we understand it, we understand it conceptually, qualitatively. It's not a mystery. We understand that what's basically is going on here. When I say, okay, let me make an analogy with, uh, with World War II, Manhattan Project, okay? What happened? 1930s in Germany, Nazi Germany, Jewish woman physicist, uh, Lisa Might, I think she was Jewish, she uh, uh, sees a nuclear fission, right, in the lab. And I actually spoke with John Wheeler about this. You know, he was telling me about some of this stuff. And, uh, and John Wheeler was visiting Niels Bohr you know, in Copenhagen, the Bohr Institute. And uh, yeah, you know, and Bohr and uh, Wheeler figured out a very simple kind of model, liquid drop model, I think it was, uh, for how the nuclear fission might work that they're seeing. And so the basic idea, they understood the basic idea of nuclear fission. Right away, everybody saw you could build a bomb, right? That, that was every, any, any physicist, nuclear physicist, Hans Peter, all these guys, they were to say, you could build a bomb. That's like what I'm saying, we could build a warp drive. We know the basic equations, you know, there's liquid drop model for nuclear fission, stuff like that. Uh, so, but, but, but of course, to actually do it, that's a big deal to actually do it. So, uh, the, so the, the, although everybody knew, Hitler knew, Heisenberg was, you know, uh, the German, the Nazis knew, and the, 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 the race was on to, to, to actually build the bomb. And it took a Manhattan Project. We actually did it with three or four years, right? That was pretty amazing. A couple of billion dollars, Richard Feynman and, and these guys and, and Beta, who was my professor at Cornell and Phil Morrison and you know, Wilson, all these guys uh, uh, under uh, Oppenheimer. And in three or four years, they actually did, a, you know, they actually built it. And uh, Heisenberg, uh, uh, I don't know, Heisenberg maybe sabotage, who knows, but the Nazis didn't get it. And they built them up. So in the same way now, I'm saying, we understand the basic equation, we understand the basic phenomena in terms of theoretically how it works, but to make a metamaterial that's gonna do it, that's, that's a big job. See, yeah, that's engineering. It's called you know, engineering physics. The theoretical physics of the phenomenon is very simple in principle. The engineering physics, of course, that's, that's a major job. 
And now, but again, I want to emphasize the cosine factor, the cosine factor shows us how to go switch from attractive gravity to, to, to repulsive anti-gravity. And that's the key component for uh, warp drive, for practical warp drive is what's called dissipative phase modulation or phase control, control of the, of, of, of the phase between the input electromagnetic field and the output gravitational field. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, well, that's just, a, that's too, let's go on to the next one. That's, okay, boy, before you do it, this is shows anybody who says, any of these assholes, pardon me, pardon my French, pardon my Brooklyn, Brooklyn language for Brooklyn, Flatbush. Anybody who says that there's an invariance problem with a coupling doesn't know what he's talking about. Just plain incompetent, it's just stupid, okay? The invari everything is mathematically kosher. Einstein's field equation is a tensor field equation. The gravity field is a second rank symmetric tensor on the left-hand side. The right-hand side is a second rank symmetric stress energy tensor. And the coupling between the electromagnetic source tensor and the gravity field output tensor, that coupling has to be an invariant. Well, but it doesn't have to be a constant. See, Einstein, when Einstein got his, his coupling, how did he do it? He didn't have any fundamental physics there. He did it, Einstein did it by what's called the correspondence argument. He wanted, he forced his theory, his equations to be consistent with Isaac Newton's earlier gravity field equations, which is called the Poisson equation. And in order to do that, and he had to put in a, he had to put in a, uh, uh, he needed a speed and he put in the speed of light and vacuum. Because, and by the way, a lot of the, a lot of the calculations of general relativity are done in vacuum. So actually the coupling doesn't may come in at all. There is no coupling. The coupling only comes in when you're inside matter. There are a few, uh, uh, in fact, the, the, the uh, what's called the Schwarzschild solution, the Kerr solution, the Rice and Nordstrom solution for gravity fields. There the gravity fields in vacuum outside the, the, the charge spinning sources. They don't often go into what's happening inside. They don't deal with it. They don't have to deal with it, okay? So, so, so this is uncharted territory. There hasn't been a lot of work. And I was see, even talking with Keith Monza the other day, trying to find literature in stellar structure, neutron star structure, uh, you know, stuff like that. Do they have to use general relativity to the equations of state for what's happening inside the sun or inside new say neutron stars are very dense. And apparently that I'm looking through Chandra Sekar, Virginia Trimble, textbooks, all the books, the, none of them really use general relativity inside materials. Nobody's done it. So it's unknown territory. Now there is one, the only person where I could find is, um, is um, hang on. This book, I don't know if you can see it. This is Relativity, Thermodynamics, Cosmology, Richard C. Tolman, Caltech. He was professor of physical chemistry and mathematical physics at California Institute of Technology. This is the Oxford University Press. And uh, when was it? 1934. 1934, guys. And he does have some stuff about what's happening inside. Okay, so um, if, now if anybody finds, if Art Wagner, you're good at this, try to find some papers, current papers on the equations of state in extreme matter uh, with general relativity corrections. So the point is, all these guys who are like criticizing me without knowing what the hell they're talking about, they don't, they, they don't even know the literature. They don't know what, the, there's no evidence that that has to be the speed of light inside. There's no evidence that if you're talking about what's happening in the physics of matter inside materials, especially these metamaterials, which have these extraordinary electromagnetic resonance properties, that there's no evidence in any experiment that the coupling inside the material is the speed of light and vacuum. There's no evidence for that. No empire, there's no reason for, but they, 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 they quote it like verse. It's like a, it's like a biblical scholar saying, you know, that the, the, that the, uh, God created the earth in seven days. And it's like that, that, that literal, you can't. And, it, and if you question it, 
you have heretic, burn them at the stake. I mean, it's that kind of bullshit from these guys. What's wrong with these assholes? Mr. Knuth and all you guys, all right? You're being stupid. So pardon me, but that's, that's my honest opinion. Um, all right, so there's this stuff. We'll get back to this. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, well, that's, uh, all right. okay. The, again, this is just the, the, uh, the uh, gravity redshift. This is the, the uh, look at this. This is the ship is moving to your right on your screen. It's moving to the right. The gravity redshift is at the nose and the gravity blue shift is at the tail. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, just, okay, just driving the point home once more that uh, when you have positive curvature, space contraction, time expansion, gravitational redshift, anti-gravity negative curvature, space expansion, time contraction, gravity blue shift. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, that just repeats. All right, you know what now? I think I've been talking long enough. I don't know, is anybody still there? Am I talking to myself? Is anybody out there? At this point, uh, Tim, let's switch. Let me get to my uh, to my iPad. Let's see if we can do that, and let's start taking some questions.